the usual thank you of sponsors, and we have wonderful sponsorship. City Mining Club keeps the wheels turning, keeps the doors open, and we have a live event. We're going back live, so that's really exciting news for everybody. You'll be able to thank all of our sponsors in person when you when you see them soon on the 2nd of December. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Our sponsors are AME Group, uh, Johnny Mac. Uh, Bear Dol- sorry, Bear Dol- Bear is Johnny Mac, and um, AME is Sean Brown. Uh, Geo's Mining Mineral Consultants, New South Wales Minerals Council. Thank you, Steve. CRU, Sydney Stock Exchange, Australian Resources and Investment Magazine, APM Graphics, ANZ Bank, Empire Energy, the shale gas company up in the Northern Territory, which is making great advances at the moment. Uh, research as a service for Nola Burke's company, uh, IAAS, AMEC, the Association of, of Mining and Exploration Companies, Hetherington Tenements Legal and Environmental. So that's Hetherington Tenement Services, great firm. David Salim, thank you. Uh, Deloitte, miningnews.net and Veritas Stockbrokers, which is um, Bryce Reynolds' company. Thank you so much for all of you. You do make our, the, the City Mining Club possible. I know it's been a lean year for, for sponsors because you just haven't had the exposure to the warm bodies in the room, but um, we are bringing them back on the 2nd of December. That event will be um, Paul Flynn presenting Whitehaven. Uh, we weren't sure if we could get, um, uh, uh, you know, what the travel would be doing by then, but certainly we've been trying to get Paul Flynn for some time and his company is now uh, on the, the, the on the rising coal prices is doing uh, very nicely again, having walked through a, a fairly dark valley, but it'd be lovely to have, have Paul in to tell us that story. Um, during this, this conversation, I'm not sure if uh, it can be seen everywhere, but there is a, there's a, a, a hand... Um, that you can stick up on the screen like that if you do want to ask a question later. There's also a, um, a chat line. And I've got the chat, bo- chat box already in the side of my screen. Um, Mark Kudafani is friends to many of you, and um, uh, you're most welcome um, to um, ask a question as we go. I'll, I'll log them all out. I will get to them all. And even if you just want to say hi, that's great too. Um, so I mentioned all of the... Um, Oh, Melbourne Mining Club, we'll be putting out a, a, a notice for them. That they, it's their 20th year. Um, we, we, uh, next year's our 25th. Uh, but Melbourne Mining Club, credit to them, they've, they've got an amazing little booklet of, of written uh, pieces by all the greats. Uh, you know, if you think of 20 great mining, mining names from Owen Hegarty to Lee Clifford to Hugh Morgan to all of those... Um, Good, uh, predominantly Melbourne folk, but uh, the big, the big names. Uh, there, there's a nice little book. It will be e- uh, emailing that out. Have a read of it. It's really nice. And congratulations, Melbourne Mining Club, on 20 years. Um, one really interesting. I was having a quick look earlier, and I picked up a really interesting release here from Anglo American, which uh, no doubt Mark is going to talk about. Um, and just before I do that, I've missed one here. We also have uh, Tony McClure's silver mines. You might know the Bowden's uh, silver mine up near Mudgee. Uh, that belongs to silver mines. And the, the operator is, uh, um, the, the managing director is Tony McClure. So the last online one will be with Tony McClure before we go back live before Whitehaven. You can, that'll be in your email. So, so now I can get on to the, um, the news of the day, which is that I've just learned that um, Mark will be, Finally, um, after an amazing innings, um, stepping down as um, CEO on the 19th of, of April in next year. So um, that was that was um, I didn't didn't see that coming, but um, how good we've got you, and uh, we look forward to um, uh, a great chat, Mark. I'll throw it over you to you now. But uh, welcome everybody, and uh, let's let's enjoy a conversation about whatever Mark wherever Mark takes us. Go ahead, mate. Thanks uh, very much, Julian. I, I was sharing with Julian uh, earlier that uh, I've uh, presented twice to the Sydney Mining Club and had fun both times. But unfortunately, from my perspective, um, one, I haven't got a scotch, so that's the first unfortunate thing. I've got my <laughs> coffee. Uh, but the second thing was in both those occasions, I had to talk hedge books. 
Uh, first, when I uh, joined Sons of Gualia, I learned what a hedge book looked like and what it could do to a business. And uh, uh, over the years, the, over two or three years, the, the chairman and I had some disagreements on how to handle the hedge book. Uh, and then going to Anglo Gold, and, and one of the reasons I got the Anglo Gold job was they said, you've had to deal with big hedge books. And um, uh, in those early conversations, I, I did make the observation that the only way to deal with it is to get rid of it. So we ended up putting six billion over the next two years in cleaning out the hedge book. And um, given this presentation today, I, I, I checked back on the wisdom or whether we spent our six billion well. In fact, the mark to market on the Anglo Gold hedge book would have been 20 billion negative today. So I told Tony O'Neill I thought that was my best decision in the mining industry, he said, no, the decision to hire him was my best decision. He said oh. he's worth a far, lot more than $20 billion. And I think given that what he's done on the technology side in the company, he might be right. Uh, and I think that's a real differentiator for Anglo-American. And, and I certainly wanted to mention, mention Tony in dispatches. He's done a fantastic job here at Anglo-American. I think it really has put the technology and the operating side back into the forefront of how mining companies should be operated. And, and uh, uh, I think Tony's credit, uh, I can't um, overstate uh, the, the contribution he's made in the business. So I did want to mention him in dispatches. Uh, right. Julian, I was going to touch four things, if I could. And uh, I always do an advertisement on the mining industry. I know I'm speaking to the converted, but uh, if I can at least share a few numbers I use, and we all talk to those types of numbers, I think we can have an impact in the, in the, um, the broader debate on our industry. I also intend in retiring to invest in uh, some, a, a sustainability chair or something like that at Wollongong University, the intellectual capital of Australia. Uh, and I think that's going to be an important piece of work for me going forward, making sure that we're promoting our industry. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about climate change and what I think we can do as a an industry to, to, to do our bit, make our contribution. Consistent with that, I'll talk very briefly about the hydrogen economy and again about the new truck that we're putting into Mahalaquina, a, a 300 tonne capacity truck, not one that will run around the, the car park or the local car park. This is the real deal. It will go into full service. It's our first pilot unit. We've built the truck ourselves. The reason we've built it is because we were sick of waiting for the OEMs to come up with something. And we got on and we'll have that in the pit quicker than Elon Musk had his first unit, uh, <laughs> electric car unit, when he established Tesla. And so, Mark, that's, that, a, no, just, in, just, that's a hydrogen truck. I just mentioned that. Yes. It's, it's a hydrogen hybrid. So it's hydrogen plus battery. But how we are setting that up is quite unique for the industry and uh, happy to share that. And then a couple of points on the Anglo-American as a point of differentiation. So maybe I'll start with Anglo and then I'll wrap with Anglo. So for those that don't know us, um, Anglo is a, a global mining company. We're, we're in Metcoal in Australia, iron ore in both Brazil and South Africa, uh, De Beers Diamonds. I'm also the, the chairman of De Beers. That tends to get more attention depending on uh, the cocktail parties you're mixing out, Julian. Uh, precious metals in South Africa and Zimbabwe. Copper in Chile. Peru and lots of exploration opportunities through South America and also up in uh, Queensland at the moment, which is quite interesting. Nickel in Brazil, 100,000 people. Uh, when I started, we were about, from a market cap point of view, about number 20 on the list in the mining companies of the world. Um, they tell me if iron ore goes to $50 a tonne, our EBITDA will actually exceed Rio's EBITDA. That would put us at number two if you took EBITDA as measured in market cap terms, if you take the financial metrics, wow. although they tend to get a little bit more of a premium on their uh, earnings than we do, given that we're in a few more difficult environments. But I would say different environments that offer a lot more opportunity, and I'm happy to take questions or talk mm. about some of those jurisdictions. And we're in Zimbabwe, for example, which I think is going to be a really interesting turnaround story in the future. So to kick on, and we're 100,000 people, 100,000 colleagues working across the globe, and uh, 
Um, it's been an absolute thrill to be to be part of the transformation of the group over the last almost nine years. Firstly, mining in society. Um, when I go around and talk to groups and we do the Indabas across Africa and, and have conversations in South America, I talk about the planet, 8 billion people, and the fact that if it's not grown, it's mined. And literally walking around the room showing people the products of mining, and we talk about the telephone, 76 different minerals, people just don't get what we do. Um, if you look at direct production and measuring that as a, a proportion of global GDP, if you then take support and services, and we've done this work in South Africa and we look across the globe, and if you then look at the products we produce and the role in the construction industry, the energy industry, the transportation industry, a whole range of other service industries, the mining industry drives the world's 45% GDP of the world's economy. And we do that with one of the smallest industrial footprints on the face of the planet. Active mining areas across the planet, about 0.3 of a percent of the Earth's planet. If you compare that to the agriculture sector, and this is not a slash at the agriculture. Yes, you've got it. Well done. Um, if you look at the agricultural sector, somewhere between 40 to 40, 40 to 50 percent of the Earth's surface, 75 percent is uh, grazing. Uh, cattle, sheep, and others, and 25% that of, of that is plants. If you then look at our industry's contribution to agricultural productivity, it's estimated that, that we help support a doubling of agricultural productivity. So if you want to talk about biodiversity and releasing land for, for nature, mining industry is the most important industry in the face of the planet. And you don't decarbonize the planet without our industry. And so it's not about what we do. The real issue is we're ranked there with bankers now at the bottom of the list in terms of uh, uh, popular professions. And so we can talk as much as we like about what we do, and, and we try and capture that in those conversations. But the second point is about how we do it and how we talk to the story. And I think that's where we've got to do a lot more work. Uh, in our industry and in our company, we talk about people. And, and when people say people are our most important resources, I almost want to vomit. People <laughs> aren't resources. The nickel, the gold in the ground, they're resources. The, the head frames, the buildings, they're resources. Mm. People are the business. Mm. They're the heart and soul of the business. When Henry Ford says you can take away my factories, um, that won't worry me because if I've still got the people, I can build the business. And making sure we put people at the centre of everything we do and not talk about them as resources or human resources, people are the heart and soul of the business. And that's the conversation I think that's been the most important conversation in our business over the last nine years. It's about how are we going to make a difference in the world. And in defining a purpose, which was around reimagine mining to improve people's lives, we've lived that purpose. It took us 18 months as a company, 100,000 people, arguing what our purpose should be whether it's the millennials that are coming in saying, you know, I want more and to be part of something more than digging a hole in the ground. I want to be part of making society a better place. And so that debate for us ended up being the outcome of that, ended up being those seven words. And it wasn't the seven words that really mattered. It was the process we went through to define those seven words. And everybody had their fingers on those seven words. So from 2017, we've tried to live that purpose in everything we do. And a good example of that is our We Care program when COVID came about. What we did is we shut our operations, we went out to communities and said, how are we going to work together to keep communities safe and to keep our operations safe? Because you can't do one without the other. And so across South Africa, across Africa, across a whole range of jurisdictions, we took different approaches but it was always about the community and what we did and how we connected with the communities. We allocated $30 million across the, the countries to, to support vaccinations. We commissioned 40 laboratories and conducted more than 800,000 screening tests 
in our countries of operation. We reached 2.7 million community members via 141 health facilities in and around our mines. That was the commitment we made to the communities in which we operated to, for them to feel safe and for us to create a safe working environment around our businesses. And at the end, we ended up working with governments because when the government said, we're going to lock everything down, I rang the Minister of Mines in South Africa and I said, okay, I understand you want to lock everything down, so you're saying we're going to turn the water off. He said, oh, no, 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 of course we can't turn the water off. Okay, all right, so we can keep the water supplies going. Mm. I said, so we're going to turn the power off. He said, oh, no, 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 we can't turn the power off. <laughs> said, okay, okay, so we can turn the power off. I said, now what about food? In three days, because don't forget, we don't have big grocery stores in far-flung parts of Africa and other parts of the world. We're going to run out of food in three to five days. Uh, how long are you going to stop? Oh, okay. He said, what do you think? I said, you might lock down for a day or two, but you better start moving food or we're going to have anarchy, people in the streets looking for food. And by the way, if people don't have money because in many parts of the world they don't save or, or they don't have refrigeration, food becomes a big issue. Okay. So we ended up getting to a conversation about how we managed a lockdown mm -hmm. in a way that broke the links and did a whole range of other things. But it changed the nature of the conversations as an industry we were having with government because they started to work out what we did. And we had those, those conversations with community members and they're starting to work out what we do in those local communities. So at the end of the day, it's not about the fact that we drive 45% of the world's economy because at the end of the day, you can say that as many times as you like. Mm. Or, or it's not the fact that people know they need money and therefore they should like bankers. Mm. That's not the conversation. It's about how you go about your business. And I'm not having a shot at bankers, by the way. I think we're all in the same boat. People think that because of what we do, people should think we're wonderful people. It's about how we do things. And so I think COVID has provided us with an opportunity to lead community improvements, developments, keeping people safe. And at the same time, we've been able to create a dialogue about what we do in society. And it's not simply about uh, digging holes and producing products like for steel. It's about everything and we touch everything in those communities. And if you remember, if you go back to how little ground we impact, on a direct basis, we probably impact about 1% of the Earth's population, i.e. living next to a mine. But it's those people that do pay the price for our activities and from our perspective, and we believe in dialogue with governments, we need to do, to do a lot more for our local communities. And in terms of our, we call it um, uh, collaborative regional development, we're now working with other mining companies, other groups, state governments, provincial governments, federal governments, in, in using our infrastructure to create a whole range of new commercial activities for those communities. So the life of community plan is better than 100 years that is, the community goes on beyond the mine and the community is a better place for the mine having been there and that the new commercial activities that we create from the infrastructure that we bring to those sites really does make a, a difference to those communities. And it's the communities who need to define what they want their community to look like in 20 or 30 years. And that's the shift we're starting to make in terms of the way we operate. On climate change, big part of the conversations. We've put to the South African government a plan to install uh, wind power on the east and west coast, solar power in the northern Cape. We have our deep underground mines that are flooded, that we can use the water in those mines as a battery, so off-peak, pump the water up and then let it run back down. So we create a fully renewable energy source for our operations across South Africa. We represent about 3% of the country's power. We'll wheel that energy through ESCOM, which is the national provider. We help South Africa deliver on its obligations in terms of climate change. We have a lower cost, more reliable source of energy. We use the renewable energy then to produce hydrogen and we use the hydrogen to get rid of diesel right across all of our operations. Today, Anglo-American is 36% renewable energy already. That's across our global operations. By 2023, we will be 56% 
renewable energy across all of our operations. In 2030, we'll have transformed the whole of our South African grid as it relates to our connections, and we operate across the country. We, we will be fully renewable by 2030. And the, 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 the kit out or the change out of our trucking fleet, which is about 440 trucks across the globe, will go from 2024 to 2034. And the first large-scale hydrogen truck fully functional at full capacity, 300 ton, 300 ton uh, payload capacity, will be trialled in February in Mahalaquina in South Africa. So it's not a truck running around a car park. It's the full deal. We've built and designed, we've designed and built this thing ourselves because the OEMs couldn't come with us and they said, look, it's going to threaten the conventional units we've got there in the Martin. We said, we're not, we're not going to wait. And as I said uh, to, to Julian... We'll, we'll have done that quicker than Elon Musk and the team did at Tesla in terms of their first operating pilot for that unit. Can I just take a moment? Wow, really enjoying this, Mark. Um, can I just uh, say to everybody who's joined, um, great to be with Mark Kudafani. He's in London drinking coffee while we're all here drinking very large glasses of scotch, and um, which I have to finish by the time he's finished. Well... And I just wanted to say there is a raise hand function down the bottom of your screen. You can wave your hand up like that, and I'll, uh, I think I'll see that. Um, I think it'll drop, drop on my top bar. Um, questions, uh, Q&A, um, chat line also down the bottom. And uh, this is a conversation. Um, I'm enthralled. Uh, Mark, just one thing struck me in the, in the figures you did put out, and this is just a comment, stay on your track, but... Um, the the um, mining occupying point for point zero four percent of, of uh, global habitable land, um, urban urban actually takes up three percent. That's seventy five times the, the area of mining, but it just shows you how much area the products take up. You know the, the but anyway. Yeah, with, don't one of the one of the key points there, Julian, and it's a really it's a, it's a great way of helping people understand what we do. When I was at um, the large open pit operators forum in Queensland back in the nineties, somebody calculated that there was more land dedicated to pubs and car parks uh, in Australia than there was to the mining industry. <clears throat> we worked that out, and we reckon that's pretty well right. Uh, and that's where the motivation came to check those numbers. And, and the 0.3% comes from satellite imaging of, of what you can see in terms of land. Distance. That includes quarrying as well, of course. So can somebody from your office give us the source of those? Can... <clears throat> yeah, yeah, I'll find that out for you. Yeah, great. Yep. Yeah, yeah, anyway, you're, uh, on, um, you're on your you're talking. Um, yeah, so, so again, it's, it's about those types of conversations about the relevance. And, and from our point of view, again, in terms of um, scope one, scope two, we're saying that we'll be carbon neutral by 2040. It will come in a lot earlier than that. We can see the pathways. We've got the plans. And for us, it's about competitive positioning. And the only thing in, in our whole transformation that I haven't yet or we haven't yet closed the gap on to create an economic return is the... Um, uh, the transformation of the trucking and the primary operating fleets. But we're within a billion. And our view is that by 2030, cost of hydrogen will be far more competitive than most other technologies, <clears throat> which will take us into full economic territory. So we'll have made the transfer and we'll be a better company as a consequence and more competitive. That's right. the vision we've taken into the business. This is about opportunity, not about cost. And so that's why that transformation has really been important. The other point I want to make is we're not talking about it, we're doing it. As I said, 2023, we're already at 36%, we'll be at 56% and we'll keep going. And I think you've got to get, up, you've got to get ahead of it to, to really make the things work. And the other thing is we've just come out uh, with a 50% uh, commitment to a 50% reduction on scope three emissions. And if the steel industry can get to full uh, green um, steel production. That really means hydrogen on a large scale and Twiggy Forest's visions coming true to some degree at least. Um, then, then that gets us to 80% uh, 
uh, scope three reduction and those sorts of things that we talk about, but we've changed and tried to help people understand how we calculate because some of the ways of calculating these numbers back in 17 were just an absolute nonsense. So we've eliminated double counting. We've taken an economic proportion on the trading component. Some companies don't even include their trading business. So we've made a lot of those types of changes and made it more practical. And for those that are interested in how we calculate, it's in our uh, on our website. You can go through how we've calculated the numbers. But the feedback from everybody, including the Anglican Church and others, has been really positive uh, and very supportive. The other thing I would say is we've also engaged stakeholders in a very different way. And for those that are aware of the faith-based initiatives uh, that, that uh, I started talking to back in 2012 when I was at Ang Anglo Gold, when we looked at our global business and we looked at Africa and South America in particular, what we observed and experienced was in most of our operations, government was absent. There's no real infrastructure. And, and we had the, the local first aid post for emergency pregnancies. Uh, we were the local government to some degree. But the group that had the most currency and impact in the community were the faith-based groups. So it might be the Catholic Church, it could be the Anglican Church, it could be Jewish faith, it could be Muslim. In Guinea, it was Muslim. By reaching out to the community groups or the, the, the faith-based groups, we were able to access about 70% of the population in a forum that was non-threatening. It was their forum. You had a full cross-section of society, and we talked about the things that were important to the community. So we thought that through and said, <coughs> we need to be strategic. So we went to the Vatican and we went to Lambeth Palace, spoke to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and we talked about mining and we explained mining's role in society. And over seven years of dialogue and work, three years ago, the Anglican Church came out, the Archbishop of Canterbury said, you know what, we've studied the Bible for the last three years. And we can't find one negative reference to the mining industry. <laughs> therefore, therefore, we believe mining should be supported if it's done responsibly and that they work with their local communities. Laudato C and all of the uh, releases from the Vatican are now constructive in terms of mining if it's done responsibly. 12 years ago, we were demons. Yep. We were demonized. And today they say, wait a minute, we believe this can happen. And, in fact, if you see all these shareholder uh, sojourns to the Vatican these days, that came off the model we established in the mining industry through the Anglo Gold and then the Anglo-American Partnership and then with the ICMM members. That model was started by the mining industry and those dialogues of business and ethical business practices was a mining industry initiative we started back in 2012. We have to continue to spread the word. And uh, that, in my view, is part of the dialogues that we've got to promote about our industry. So it's not simply about the key messages. It's also about how we do business, how we connect, and how we can shape our businesses to serve society, to serve those local communities. Because at the end of the day, if we can't connect with local communities, we don't have businesses. And so that's the, that's the difference in terms of approach we've used. If I then say just a couple of things about Anglo-American, and then I'll shut up, Julian, but I think... Um, it's important to, to probably explain how we connected some of the dots. Firstly, I talked about our purpose. We did a lot of hard stuff through 13 through 15. We, we were an absolute disaster as a company. We had $14 billion worth of debt. Uh, we had 70-odd assets, half of which were making money and the other half were never going to make money. So we did some massive portfolio change. Uh, we went from 160,000 people um, and uh, we, we actually tightened down to 90,000. So probably the we believe the largest uh, restructuring of a major corporate, uh, certainly in the mining industry, for 50 years. Um, but interestingly, our production actually went up. So we went from 68 to 35 assets and our production went up. So how we turned that around, we implemented the uh, different organisation model. For those that used to work at CRA, you would remember the, the Carnegie transformation in the 80s, very similar. We used the same principles. We used the requisite model. 
for those that don't understand where Rekras had came from, it actually came, the original work was done in Toyota, uh, and those will remember Deming and statistical process control, in control and capable. The other side of that conversation was the organisation work done by Elliot Jacques. Elliot Jacques was the guy that Carnegie brought into Rio through the 90s for that transformation. We've modernised all of that work. We've worked with Toyota. We've worked with a whole range of others. We talked to BMW and we've implemented an organisation model and an operating model. This is more an industrial model. It's very different to what anyone else has done in the industry. And that really has helped transform the business. We then did lots of work on uh, technical and technology. So getting the basics right, so really getting back to basics. So that work has been really important. And then using technology as a way of transforming the business going forward. If you look at mining for the last 100 years, we've generally just upsized the equipment. And so the law of diminishing returns, in our view, has been the problem. We said we're going to rethink mining basically at the core, and that is rethink these processes. So bulk ore sorting, new crushing technologies, new classification technologies, coarse particle flotation. You've got some of that in Australia today at Newcrest. A, a whole range of technology to reduce our energy consumption by 30%. Remember, in, uh, in 1900, uh, compared to today, or if you compare today to the 1900s, to produce a pound of copper, we're, we're moving 16 times the amount of waste and we're using 16 times the amount of energy to produce a pound of copper. Mm. We, we said we're going to knock that back by 30%. And we're going to halve the amount of water. And that's how, where our technology thrust has been. And that's about future competitive positions. We changed the whole marketing approach, started to look at how we mine the value chain. So when people ask me about um, uh, business models for major corporates, I'm always a bit cheeky. And I say, look, Glencore, trader. And they're the best in the industry at trading. But that's their shtick. They do it extremely well. They have started to move into operations improvement. They've done some good work, but they're traders. Second, Vale, logistics company. Big trucks, big trains, big ships. Get the iron ore to China as cheap as you can. When it goes into mining, it gets a little bit tougher. Mm. Three, BHP, miners. Mm. Don't want to go past concentrate because then you're putting a lot of money in, you don't get the returns. Rio, a bit like BHP, although from time to time, I think they fancy themselves as um, investment bankers trying to pick <laughs> commodity prices as well. We define, and I've been cheeky, and I know many of my colleagues will understand I'm being a little bit, I'm having a little bit of fun. We love, we love all of our colleagues. We talk about ourselves as mining the value chain. And so at De Beers, where we make money, digging a diamond, getting it into rough, the midstream, very difficult, very competitive. We don't try and do, much, do too much in the midstream. On the back end, with the beers, the jewellers, we trade. So 70% of our EBITDA is the front, 30% the back. And we look at those value chains and work out where the leverage points are. That's where we put our capital. So for the last eight and a half years, we've delivered an 18.5% TSR to our shareholders as a consequence of the transformation and the focus on value and the focus on building margins. We've improved our margin 60% in the first half of this year. Our, our EBITDA was uh, $12.1 which is 60% higher than we've ever done before and a half. And we're on track this year to, to beat our annual EBITDA record over 104 years by at least 60%. And for me, that's a good time to say I've done my bit. The foundation's are there to continue to improve. If the iron ore price hits 50, then in terms of earnings, we'll be right up there, uh, certainly second behind BHP. And all I'd say to Mike Henry is you better start looking over your shoulder. <laughs> I think he is already, mate. There's a lot of principles that, that I mean, you know, the how you translate the thought into, into process is, is the challenge, right? It's, there's a lot of people talking and promising, everyone's promising and hoping, but um, how exciting. And funny, you invited, well, your your company invited me to an innovation workshop 
2017, was it? Somewhere around there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, nice to see you've taken up all my ideas, by the way. So, uh, <laughs> Julian, Julian, can yep. I make a comment on that? Yep. So just to explain what you just said. So we established what we call open forums. Yep. And on water, on uh, classification, on sustainability, we would invite people from all other industries. And the one rule we had in our open forum is you weren't allowed to have more than 50% of our own people in the forum or from your own industry. Yeah, they right. had to be from other industries. Yep. So, you know, the, a little Welsh engineer that used to be uh, in the water board for Wales had some of the most brilliant ideas on how to clean up water. So those f- open forums have become the, 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 the capturing mechanism for these global ideas, whether it's out of the automobile sector, the water sector, you are part of one of those. That's how far we've gone in looking for ideas uh, in terms of improving business. And those open forums have become the catalyst for sort of 100,000 ideas down to 20 or 30 critical ones that will change our business. Yeah, no, it's really lucky I was there, eh? Um, <laughs> uh, the, no, it's great. I, I enjoyed it a lot. And and it was, um, you know, the, you have to, there's a lot of this kind of sticky notes on the wall and, you know, you, you sort of, you, you sit around in the space and kind of, you must have been through hundreds of these kind of, and then sitting down with you, each mine and each group and doing the transformation and listening a lot. And then, you know, you know I mean, that's what I, how I, I always think of that. Your style is always sort of sitting down with a whole bunch of people and really getting stuck into a, a long conversation with them, you know. So um, that must have been the journey, right? You, uh, getting it into all those different languages in all those different countries. I think, well, it, well I think the more important point in the, in the point about the transformation, it's about people and, and putting the right people, the executive, and then through the organisation and building the organisation has been the most important part of the, the transformation. And, and um, by the way, we're still a works in progress, as you know. Yeah. Always going to be a works in progress. And, try, and, you, and you see things, you make mistakes, but having an organisation where you can debate and, and, and understand the mistakes and, and work on correcting them as quick as you can, that's the most important part of the learning exercise. Now, the funny thing was that uh, Robert Bolton uh, made a comment and said, great session, Mark. And funny, he, he said, um, I, stand, I understand that you're aware of the Elliot, of, of Elliot Jarks in relation to organisational management. Did you apply any of Elliot's ideas in Anglo. You've already answered the question for him ahead of time. Um, any more questions? Keep them, you know, there's, there's a, you can raise your hand or just put in the chat column on the right-hand side. So good way to go. But so there you go. You already, um, and who was, um, who was Elliot Shah? He was a, he was a Canadian clinical psychologist that uh, worked with Lord Brown after World War II in the UK to work out how they could change the labour system in the country to improve productivity as part of the reconstruction. So he was a young guy. He was the guy that uh, uh, identified the midlife crisis syndrome back in the 60s and 70s. Um, He's done some interesting stuff, but the most interesting piece was his work at Toyota with Deming. Uh, and um, they did a lot of the early work. You know, Toyota and the vision for Toyota came from the family, but they then studied and did their work on what worked, what didn't work. Then Jacques did a lot of work in GE under Jack Welsh uh, and studied levels of work, so people might understand stratified systems theory, levels of work, um, how to get the accountabilities right, all those sorts of things. So. Uh, that's a that's probably a topic for a, a conversation of in of its own right. But a lot of the old CRA guys who were there in the 90s, particularly a guy called Ian McDonald, is the guy we've used to help us with our work here, and he's been fantastic. But in the end, you've got to own it and 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 uh, apply the basics. But it's just about people and making sure they're right for the job. Yeah, it's funny you make that comment about um, the people are the business. It's, um, <clears throat> it always sticks in my gills when the government you know, we, we talk about the government sector, but then they refer to they refer to us as the private sector. Uh, we're not a sector. We're actually the economy. <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Actually, there's a great, for anybody that's interested, if you can get hold of the movie And Justice for All, it's an Al 
Gino movie. I think it was. Um, I can't remember who the director was. Uh, Jew, it might have been Norman Jewish. And there's a scene in there, and I play this to the leadership team and, and right away across the organisation, where uh, it's a movie about the legal industry or the legal uh, profession losing its humanity. And there's a scene in the car park where Al Pacino confronts a colleague about not caring for their clients. And it's it, don't you care, don't you care, don't you care. It's about the relationship we have with the people. And I got up and was in tears in Sudbury when we did the transformation through Inca and I talked about caring for people. And we were talking about the negotiation of the wage contracts. And I said, until the people in that negotiation understand we actually do care, it's just going to be another fight. Mm. And so they went into the negotiation with a very different approach. They actually introduced themselves before they started the wage negotiation. It's a real dance in Canada. They did something very different to whatever had ever been done in the negotiation. They introduced themselves as people. My name's Mark. I've got seven kids. My wife's Luana. She reckons I'm a dad. Boop, 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 went through the whole process. And the union guys, after the first half hour of the, the company management team introducing themselves, and they had their ethics and values around the top, and they said, if we don't do, if we act inconsistent with these values, call us to account. At the end of the first half hour, the union stopped the negotiations and said, this is, this is, this is, un, yeah, we're not going to put up with this shit. And, and they went away and had to um, uh, collaborate for uh, about an hour, working out what they were going to do with the management that, that was trying to be human. <laughs> and they came back in and said, we're going to give it a try. But the minute you don't act consistent with one of these values, it's on. <laughs> and then, then they introduced themselves. All right. And and this is this is after we had had a big strike three years before. We got the deal at eleven fifty nine, right at the end, and it was it, it it was the relationship at the end that allowed both parties to move that last step. Mm. And it was and they said we've never had anything like that before. Mm. The tragedy of all of that is when Vale took over and we, we talked about the transformation we'd been through, uh, they said, yeah, but, but um, your guys are getting paid more than we get in Brazil. And I said, yeah, but they're producing three times as much product per person. And they said, no, 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 no. They have to, they have to do it differently. So, unfortunately, trust got thrown out the window. And for those that understand, there was a one-year strike uh, about a year later, which was the next negotiation. Uh, went went a different went a different road. So anyway, there are important things to learn. I think. Yeah. Um, anyway, Robert Robert Bolton's comment. He said, "I was not aware Deming worked with uh, Jacques at Toyota, but this is interesting." Very so, early days. Very early days. But not not many people are aware that he that he that he was involved in that work, and that was where they did a lot of their formative, or he did a lot of his formative thinking uh, around uh, some of the principles. Mm. Mark, um, I mean, fr front of mind, you know, it's it's nice. The, the energy of Anglo is so good in that it, you know, it's flowing out into all of these different nations on all of these different continents, and 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 it's really inclusive. And you're producing for every. I mean, we, you and I know that. Well, we all know on this on this meeting uh, what you know that, that how wonderful wealth is. It makes education. It makes warmth it makes food it makes you know we, we know all that stuff um you know but but and that's a really cohesive world picture but then behind that at the moment we've got quite a few um you know rapid changes in 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 the geopolitics of the, of the world and of course um you know we have to put china at the top of that list um you know as you as you come to the, the end of it, your term there and and thinking about that world and you know it's that's that's sort of the it's kind of the flip side you know you know in a way it's your peripheral vision because because you 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 know you're focused on doing what you do doing best but I'm I'm also interested from your perspective you know the in in, in London you must have some very interesting colleagues I dare say that you you, you hang out with um you know and, and cross over with the, in in different circles there. What do you, what's your um what's your sense about you know, the, is there anything 
you could say to us about the, the geopolitics and the role of China and how you see the, the world changing? Yeah, look, um, I, I don't know if you know Steve Howard from the Global Foundation. No, I don't. Uh, uh, Steve Howard has done a lot of work in China. Um, he's Australian. Uh, the Global Foundation uh, and Forward and uh, and Forward and, and Steve are um, partners, but um, Anne, you would remember from uh, Channel 10, I think. Uh, she was a presenter on... Uh, Channel 10, but yep. they really good work with the Global Foundation and are quite well connected in China. We've, we have, we've been having a lot of discussions about how do, how do we create a relationship that's both respectful both ways and, and um, opening and, and um, um, works from a business perspective. And, and um, I do... Every year I do sessions with leaders from China business at Cambridge University. So I do a, a couple of hours and I go through the transformation we've been through at Anglo. And the Chinese leaders are really interested in the work we're doing. They're also interested in what we do with communities and the leadership stuff. And they're also interested in the stratified system stuff, the, the organisation stuff. And they're fascinated by those types of conversations. And we agreed in those sessions that from our point of view, um, it's business that's going to be the key or could be a key in bringing the relationships back together. At the end of the day, yeah. um, China's on a pathway that you're not going to change and it has a view about its own security uh, that you're not going to change. The question is, can that be done and can they achieve their objectives while being respectful of Australia and others in terms of our expectations and access to markets both ways? And so trying to find the dialogue, I think, is really important. I think at a national level, we've lost the ability to be subtle in our foreign relations. And when you've got your most significant trading partner where it is today, I think there's fault on both sides. And uh, I'm not going to make up excuses from either side, but I think there has to be a dialogue. And at the end of the day, I think business is probably the only or one of the few areas where a dialogue can be started that's constructive, that's appropriate. I've got uh, friends who, who run large Chinese corporations who have asked me to come over next year uh, as soon as I've finished and, and talk about how we might be able to help promote a dialogue. Now, I think the Global Foundation with Steve Howden and the crew have also got good resources and good connections on the ground that may be able to help those types of dialogues. But we've got to we've got to some way, in some way, shape or form, get the conversations moving and try and uh, sort these issues out. I mean, whilst I'm enjoying $400 a ton met coal, what's happening in the met coal industry in terms of China is just crazy. Uh, and we won't get that sorted. But I think we've got to go in there um, very open and be able to listen to both sides. And 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 I think we've both made errors and and uh, I think there's people of goodwill from both sides. We've got to work out how to do that. But we'll certainly work through the foundation. I, I intend to try and work with Steve and the guys through the Global Foundation because I they're sort of the best connected that I've seen in trying to get these conversations moving forward. <clears throat> so um, for the benefit of anybody who you know, we were chatting beforehand, of course, Mark is going to go and uh, live uh, in Italy when he uh, after April next year and... Um, and, and he isn't going to stop, and you can see that right now. He's uh, going to be popping up in China by the sound of it. Um, and Wollongong. And Wollongong. Oh, you name dropper. <laughs> 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 hey, um, last time I think you were at Sydney Mining Club, we gave you the box set of uh, Auntie Jack CDs. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely probably, right. Probably never had time to, to look at them, but there it's a uh, yeah, that'd be that'd be worth a lot of money one day. Uh, yeah, the place where they discovered um, Norman Gunston, of course, you know, dear to our heart. My, my um, mother tells me she remembers Graham Bond when he was a normal guy. <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that, that's a quote from Mum. Yeah, yeah I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't think he ever was, but anyway. <laughs> the, um, uh, the, uh, probably got some good stories about you too, mate. Um, now, so I've so, um, got a question here from Ian Cooper. Uh, he's just saying, and probably not to overwork it, but um, give us a, a snapshot on on your um, safety commitment. And and look, I, why don't we throw onto the other end of that 
you know, you've been through the long dark valley on, on Grosvenor up in, in the Bowen Basin um, and you're slowly bringing that back on now, I understand. Um, you know, just um, safety, we can talk about values and, you know, till the cows come home, but just just what, what's Thank the case of that? So when, when, um, when I went to South Africa, I'll start with AGA because I think that was an important part of the journey. Um, Anglo-American in 2007 had 75 fatal accidents in its global mining operations. Um, and somebody said to me when I said I was going to South Africa and was a, a leader of a large diversified mining company, uh, said, I, I just left South Africa because I can't imagine how you could fix it. Uh, and I said, well, I'm going to South Africa because I'm willing to give it a try. And uh, at Anglo Gold, the guys did a really good job. Uh, and, and we because you had the deep underground gold mine. So you had to make technical changes, people changes, but the belief that you could eliminate for fatal incidents was uh, really important. And, and I remember making a speech and about a week later, the guys come back with a little plastic plaque and said, this is the day safety changed in our company. And it was that conversation. I said, if you, were, if you are not prepared to send your brother underground to work in your mine, then shut it. And that conversation drove a different conversation in the group. In the last 12 months, we've had one fatal incident, and that's one too many. But from where we were back in 2007 to there is a significant improvement. But I think measuring performance is, is different again. In 2007, we lost a 1,000 colleagues. We were losing three people a day to HIV and AIDS. Well, Anglo, Anglo Gold and Anglo American was the first company to um, uh, introduce uh, antiretroviral drug treatments uh, to the workforce and families. And I remember Bobby Godsell making the announcement back in 2000 that they were doing that. Today, our prevalence rate is the lowest in the country in terms of if you look at big groupings. Tuberculosis used to be a major issue because that was also connected with HIV. Um, our tuberculosis rates across the business now is about 70% lower than the average community. And if you remember, silicosis was a big issue. That's been eradicated. So the changes haven't been just on the safety side. It's been right across health. So in our last seven years, we've reduced uh, injuries, fatal injuries, uh, 95%, health incidents and exposures by 95%. And interestingly, we've eliminated environmental exceedances by 97%. So for me, it talks to getting your operations in control, looking after people, getting your operations in control, planning and executing work as it should be done, and all of those things head the right way. We've actually taken 50% out of our cost structures over the eight years. And so when I connect safety to business performance, it's all about, it's all about the work, planning the work, making sure people are trained to do the work, and the benefits flow through to everything. So for us, Safety and care for people. And again, if you go back to don't you care, until you demonstrate you care, safety won't be front and centre in that organisation. And that impassioned, tearful plea about my don't you care and I played the Al Pacino clip was about safety. Mm. But I said it then touches everything because people won't give you the best they've got unless they believe you care and you're providing them with an opportunity to make a difference. And safety is where all of that starts. Got some other questions down the side here. Um, the, uh, from James Hyde, can you run us through the economics of converting to a hydrogen truck fleet, back of the envelope type numbers? How does upfront capex and running costs compare to current diesel? That's a that's a Yeah, the, yeah very simple. Very simply put, and it's a good question. So uh, from our point of view, um, the, the uh, mains energy cost that we pay in South Africa at the moment is probably about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, and, it's, and it's going up at, um, and that's in US dollars, and it's going up at uh, around 
10 to 11 percent a year. So first point is you've got to look at your whole system. Our move to renewable sources is really important in breaking that inflation price cycle on main systems. So that's really important to us. And I'd hope that that takes about 30% out of our cost base and gives us a much more reliable cost base. So that's the first point. Using a solar unit on site, 100 megawatt, and we've got the government to deregulate and they've allowed us now to build that 100 megawatt unit, will give us the capacity to produce the hydrogen we need to put into the trucks. Um, the, the, the solar energy operating cash cost is about two or three cents a kilowatt hour. And then converting that to hydrogen, uh, and basically hydrogen is a storage, uh, is, is just a way of storage, oh, storing yes. energy. And that storage uh, is equivalent to storing in a lithium battery. So I think the, the conversion rate is about 67 so about 60, about 70 percent efficient. And so ultimately the total cost of input and conversion to hydrogen putting in the truck, we think um, by 2030 it's at break even and the um, uh, price escalation against the conventional diesel, uh, main supply system, the gap opens up over time. So we, we can justify our investment by 2030 on a, uh, on a capital return against the renewables plus the hydrogen conversion, but then it becomes lower cost beyond 2030. We're not trying to justify uh, primary hydrogen production per the Twiggy uh, proposals. This is a mobility application of um, uh, the renewables and the solar system we'll put inside the gate. The broader system is, is how we uh, provide uh, energy for the whole system. But if you'd like to know more, I'm happy to connect you to Tony and the guys, and they can give you a better sense of uh, uh, what we're thinking, how we do everything. We are looking for partners. We, we don't want to be long-term truck manufacturers. <laughs> uh, we're happy, and we've said this to the guys, we're happy for you to buy it and we'll, we'll take a, a cut of because we, we've locked people out of doing a whole range of designs because we've our, our patents have been pretty robust and we've said we're happy for you to take the whole system over. In fact, that's what we prefer and we'll take an economic slice of, of that action, modest, to, to, to pay back all the work we've done plus a little bit. Uh, but it's going into the way we're structuring the business. The reason hydrogen truck option was better than um, uh, uh, the uh, more fixed uh, trolley wire systems, super capacitors, was the flexibility it gives with our cutback strategies, particularly in the base metal mines, and, and particularly our ability to be flexible through commodity price cycles. So when you take the whole picture into account, the system works well for us. It's a bit better than the integrated system in South Africa. We think within five years, it'll start to compete with the more cost-effective jurisdictions in South America and Australia. Right. Well, <clears throat> uh, if you're in the mood for receiving compliments, um, Matt Wall says, uh, Mark, congratulations on a stellar career. Very impressed with Anglo's drive to reduce Anglo's carbon footprint on shipping. Can you expand on these initiatives? Uh, cheers, Matt Wall. I, uh, thanks, Matt. Um, I think um, um, basically the first step is to um, align with our suppliers on the use of LNG, which then will ultimately convert to hydrogen over agreed time frame. So our marketing department, and, and when we did our marketing, whole re redid the whole strategy, based our marketing team. So instead of being within the business units, took it up to the top, integrated, got scale on uh, uh, logistics, changed the whole approach. And, and by the way, on that side, we, we improved our realised iron ore prices by 13% against our competitors with a different approach in the marketing side and really niching our products and their higher quality. And so we, we, we sort of take different places. And consistent with that, the team negotiated a whole new set of contracts with the shipping lines and then ultimately the deals going forward, uh, LNG converting to hydrogen over the next 10 years so that, that we've got a, a carbon-free footprint on the shipping side as well. And again, uh, we can give more detail through Peter Whitcutt and the team on that point. 
Great. Okay. Well, look, we're, we're coming up on time now, mate. Um, Robert Bolton's also just made a comment, and we'd, it'd probably be nice to see, and I, I have heard you working with this 45% figure before, uh, like your 45% of GDP is driven related to mining sector is a useful fact. Not many people are aware of as I've referred many others to this stat. Have, is there a little background paper piece on on, on how that's that you could... Yeah, what, what, um, so I did the work personally, and, and what I did is I looked at the, the um, and, and I'll tell you, we're doing a little bit more on it, but what I did when I was at AGA is I looked at the revenue allocation uh, for the extractives against global GDP, and it was $7 trillion against $70 trillion. That's where the 10% came from. I then used the South African Chamber of Mines work on support and services industry where I got that second 10%. I then went through each sector and its contribution to the 70 trillion GDP and, and, and tried to allocate, for example, in the construction industry, what, is, what, what can you do or what can't you do without steel or bricks? You know, where does all that stuff come from? And said, well, you know what? Uh, if you don't have the materials, you can't build high-rise building. It's all mined product. So what's the allocation? Is it 50%? One could argue 30 to 50%. Same with energy, same with transportation, same with mechanised processes, agriculture. I went through uh, Mitch Hook, who is a farmer, who, who gave me some of the stats on agricultural contribution and brought that back to the 20%. I got 25% the balance. That's how we got the 45. Now, I've got economists doing a run from various directions to give us another range. And what they're saying is, look, it's, it's not a bad number. I've only ever had one person challenge me. It was an economist who said it's 35%. <laughs> and I said, okay, what if we agree to somewhere between 35 and 40%? He said, yeah, I'll, do, I'll go with that. Okay. So, but we are getting more work done, and I'm happy to share that because I'll yeah. do that more publicly, and I'm going to take that into the sustainability work I do in Wollongong. Uh, in the next year or so, because uh, I really think we need to pin that and put all the other messages together to really change the way we're talking about our industry to the public. Sounds like uh, Robert Bolton must be a bit of a groupie of yours. He, um, he said, I recall listening to your talk, talk circa 2012 when you were uh, at Anglo Gold in, in Middle East. Well, he certainly very informed questions. Thank you so much, Robert Bolton. Mark, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up there. I've, um, I'm just going to... <laughs> My, Michael Minns says, um, Wollongong, that is great. So so tell us about Wollongong. You're going to be back through our way. You get, we're not going to be... You're going to be... You got any any of those kids down here or out of... Yeah, uh, two, two, it's still two in Wollongong. One's at Wollongong University, actually. And... Uh, one uh, has got a heap of anytime gyms all over the country. So he works out of Wollongong. He's had a pretty tough uh, 18 months. Uh, and I've got another one in uh, Canberra and uh, four kids over here. But um, I will, and mum is still in Wollongong. So I'll, I'll head back in the new year uh, to see mum and, and go and see the friends at uni and, and, and work out uh, what we might do going forward. But I made the promise when I retired that I'd go back to Wollongong and, and sponsor something on the sustainability side at the university, and I'll, I'll, I'll be good for that commitment. Um, and um, um, hopefully we can help the university. They've had a pretty tough time too. So yeah, well, let, let us know what we can do to help. We've been uh, bringing through, particularly when Flynn was at the uni there, we were bringing through a lot of um, students and taking them down to camp, you know, important meetings and uh, Getting getting them across, you know. So so absolutely, we anything we can Sydney Mining Club can do to help there. Um, one other one other point, Julian, I should make it. I, you you did ask me about Grosvenor. Um, we have Grosvenor ready to produce, but basically what we've done is redesigned a coal mine uh, based on all of our learnings from the uh, the methane ignition uh, last year, and uh, we're fully automating the operation. Uh, so we can run the long wall from the surface. And in fact, we've run about uh, 40 or 50 shears from the surface at North Murrumbah. Uh, and that's going through a bit of a tougher time through strata at the moment. We think the next long wall is clear of the seam rolls. 
Uh, but basically for us, Grosvenor becomes our next generation mine. And, and for us, it's automation, a whole range of new things the guys have done. They've done fantastic work based on the lessons we've learned. We've got a lot of lessons we learn as a corporate as part of that process. We're very open to share those, those uh, learnings as well. But uh, it's ready to, it'll be ready to go in the next two or three weeks, but we've still got to navigate the processes through the government. So that may take a while, I'm not sure. But certainly uh, we, the guys have done a great job and I think it, it really does become the next generation template, certainly for us as a company. Well, how clever also did, well, you, you know, you've got the you've got the broad enough shoulders to do it, but how great that to take that, you know, it was a terrible incident that happened and to be able to convert it into a really good story like, you know, never again, what a great result. Um, Flynn Melnick is actually working on uh, methane drainage, at, uh, you know, uh, drain, gas drainage at, at Kestrel now. So <laughs> so he he might um, might be heading across there to learn something too. Um I'm happy here. Um, apologies to John Hill. We didn't get a written uh, question from him and we, we didn't, weren't able to cross to him. But apart from that, we've done really well. Um, I've nearly finished my glass, but I have to tell you, it's actually iced tea, not scotch. But um, it looked good, didn't it? <laughs> Mark, really great to be with you, mate. And um, when you're in Sydney, you know, please, um, anything we can do to help the uni, we, we, we're deadly keen. We've been pulling... What do we do? I think we charge we charge um, students fifteen dollars for lunch that costs us ninety five dollars. So um, <laughs> we uh, we do we, we feed as many students as we can. We love to see them. And um, who's this? Um, Ross and Halichev. I know Ross and Halichev. <laughs> there you go. Hello, Ross. <laughs> How good. We sponsored Rossen from Romania many, many years ago in Kalgoorlie. I've got that right, Rossen. There he is. Maybe I've got him up the top here. I'll see if I can turn him. To, so um, I've got to ask him to unmute himself. Rossen, I've seen got you a little screen up there. Can um, maybe we can hear you? I've, we're not really good at this, but so I, I'm hearing me. There he is. We're hearing you. Are you hearing me? Yes. Yep. Yes. Sir. We met with Mark in 1992 when he was my managing Kilgore Stupid. And uh, he gave me the green light as a mining engineer in Australian mining industry. Thank you very much, Mark. We were very young. Now, 30 years later, <laughs> we have this opportunity again to meet each other. You're a great miner. You belong to Australian mining industry history. I am proud of having you. As a colleague and friend, thank you very much. Wishing you all the best. Thanks, Rossen. And Rossen taught me a lot about open pit mining and planning. So uh, we all learn. And Rossen taught me a lot about mining. Thank you, Rossen. Thank you, Rossen. Yeah, good. There you go, mate. Nice little touch. Thanks for that. Um, that was very nice. Yeah, no, we managed to do it finally. And uh, now, just anyway, sorry, John Hill. Uh, look, um, yeah, um, great session. Really enjoyed your company. We've, we've, we have recorded this. This will go out as a resource right across our uh, airwaves. And, um, and uh, you know, we uh, wish you all the best and with your 100,000 people around the world. And uh, you got a, you got the rundown till April and, and I'm sure you're not going to stop. So I don't know. No such thing as retirement. No, no, no. It's always my family's like that too. You sort of. What do you what do you do then? You know, it's, um, but anyway, lovely to see. Only because they don't want you at home. Yeah, yeah well, that's the thing. Um, <laughs> just well, I've heard that one. They um, the, the wives kick them back out, um, or spouses, I should say more correctly. Um, the um, so so we've got we've got a couple more of these. One more um, one more um, online one. Then we're going live again. Mark, any old time you're in Sydney and you want to do a live show. You're on. So come and see us, and uh, you know it's always a huge amount of fun. And um, and it's your tribe down here. We're proud of you. You're an Australian. You've done well. Thank you so much, mate. Well, thank you for the support, and uh, it, it's been a great ride. Forty five years. I look forward to the next forty five years being as much fun. <laughs> Good on you. Thanks, members. See you all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Cheers. Mark.
Bye, mate. Bye.